Good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? Good. Did you get some good gifts? How are you doing online this morning? Are you up? All right. Did you get some good gifts? Merry Christmas. Hey, I'm excited to um, bring to a conclusion the story of Christmas, but it does continue, doesn't it? It just continues on in our lives, the story of Christmas. So we, we a uh, number of weeks ago, started with this whole series, and we talked about the words coming to Mary from the angel that she would give birth to the Son of God. And Joseph and her kind of worked it out because Joseph was like, what do you mean you're pregnant by the Holy Spirit? I'm filling in a little bit here. But, and then the angel appeared to Joseph and said, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because what's going on in her is from God. It's of the Holy Spirit. And we traced Mary and Joseph as they went up to Bethlehem where Jesus was born. And they're still there. Uh, when we get to this part of the story of the wise men, they're still in Bethlehem. Uh, that Jesus is probably about uh, two years old or somewhere in there, one to two. Most think about two years old when the wise men came. And now you think when the wise men come, you think, wow, I've seen those nativity scenes where you have the, the, the shepherds and you've got Jesus, Mary and Joseph, and the wise men at the nativity. Well, that is theologically inaccurate, everybody. I'm sorry to ruin your nativity scene at home. Take the kings out. Say, that's the whole set, I know. But the kings come later, all right? They come a little later. And they come for the purpose of worshiping Jesus. They come for the purpose of offering him gifts, all right? Offering him gifts. So let's talk about the wise men, the magi, all right, from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. We have this. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. All right, the Greek word for wise men is magi, okay? Magi, singular, magi. And um, we don't know exactly who they are. They're wise, translated as wise men, magi, because um, some believe that these are Persian um, sort of consultants to the king. They, they, nobody knows exactly who they are or what part of the east they're from. Some suggest Persia, others Babylon, others even Arabia. Uh, commentators are a little bit over the, all over the map on where, who these people are. Some suggest that they were really good at stargazing and astronomy and maybe even a little astrology they don't know because they follow the star to find where Jesus is all right they're making a, a, a if they're from Persia it's like an 800 mile trip to see Jesus all right they they see that he's been born they're following his star and uh, they make this long trip but anyway we got these wise men uh, these mad joy uh, from the east, can they come to Jerusalem and they want to see Jesus? All right, that's why they're there. Saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. All right, so they're from the east. They see the star and they're following the star. Now this uh, may be a fulfillment of, uh, maybe they knew this from the book of Numbers. Numbers 24, verse 17 says, now, this is Balaam's prophecy now. He says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter, something to rule with, shall rise out of Israel. Some believe this is a, 
the star rising and leading these magi um, wise men is because of this prophecy. There are also prophecies from the book of Isaiah and Psalms and other places about this ruler, all right? And in those cases, it said the ruler will come out of Arabia. And uh, so we're a little bit over the map. But what was this star that arose? What was that? Do anybody see Jupiter and Saturn pretty close to lining up on the 21st? Yeah. You know, yes, yes. A little cloud cover, but then it went away. The 20th, December 20th was better, I think. But that being said, um, you know, some trace it back and they suggest that there was some kind of conjunction of stars that these guys followed. Others suggest uh, that it was some kind of meteor that they followed. What is this star? Could be translated shining. Others think that it was a manifestation of the Shekinah glory of God. You know, in the Old Testament, yet another shining, which was the fire. The Israelites in the wilderness were led about by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire at night. And uh, so perhaps it began as a shining and they followed it, put it together with scripture. We don't know exactly what this is okay i'm gonna i'm gonna suggest to you that it's the shekinah glory at least when they get into jerusalem uh they'll see it again all right so they've come where is he who's born king of the jews so they knew that much they knew their old testament scripture right they although most commentators believe the magi are not jewish they're gentile all right non-jew or they could be a mixture if they come from Babylon of Babylonian and Jewish. Are you with me here? Are you following all this at home? You're taking notes of all this. Okay. You're like, help us out, Pastor. Give us what you think. All right. We don't know. All right. We really don't. But it's an amazing, it's an amazing account in the story of the life of Christ. So these guys, they come. We saw a star, a star when it rose and come to worship him when Herod the king heard this, he was what? Troubled, troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Why was Herod troubled? Which, by the way, is an interesting contrast between Herod and the wise men. The wise men came all that way, all right? They came all that way, following the star, seeking him to worship him, but not Herod. Herod is troubled and all Jerusalem. Now, I this is why I think that there there were more than three. We, by the way, again your nativity set. We've got to read through your nativity set. I'm so sorry. Some of you spent a lot of money on that. I know, uh, but we usually think in terms of three kings, right? Right. And the reason is because they gave gold, frankincense, and myrrh as gifts. So we think, well, there's three kings because there's three gifts. All right, but the scripture doesn't say that. They gave him the gifts, but there could have been 10, 10 of them. Um, I, think, I think this is a big entourage of these wise men, powerful kings, uh, whoever they are, uh, uh, an entourage with the camels and the people with them. I think it's a big deal coming into Jerusalem because Herod who is king at the time, is really like thrown about, he's thrown about by this. Like, what are you doing here? What, you know, it's not that nice little quiet, go to the Bethlehem and worship. It's like, we've come, you know, from Babylon, Persia, or some other parts, Arabia perhaps. We've come to worship the one who's king of the Jews. Where is he? Now, Herod was king. Okay, he was king. Of course, you have Augustus, you have Caesar right, uh, Augustus and Vaspian and the other Caesars, but you, you have the king over the Jews, which was, he was a puppet of Rome, all right? And Herod's a very insecure guy. You see that here. He's very, he's very threatened by a new king showing up. Jesus, who is this? He doesn't want to be, you know, replaced. Uh, history tells us about Herod the Great, who this is, that he... Uh, he died like in around 4 B.C., somewhere in there. That's why the, the commentators believe Jesus was born actually before, you know, um, A.D. 1 or whatever, but before um, that, probably around four, 3 or 4 B.C. But he, history tells us that he had nine wives, Herod the Great, nine of them. 
And that one of them even had killed along with some others because he thought they were trying, they were, there was a conspiracy against them. So he had family members and one of his wives killed. So not a good place to be in Herod's group. You know, very insecure. And people have different reactions to Jesus, even in our day, wouldn't you agree? Some, you're here to worship him. You're online to worship him. Christmas, you get it. God's come into the world in Jesus Christ. Let's worship him. Let's find and worship him. But some are very threatened by Jesus, as Herod is. Troubled, threatened. Don't want him to upset our life. You can't have a nativity scene on public property. There's something really intensely threatening about that. Like, what is that? You got some animals, whatever. But threatening. Can't pray, you know. You can't pray in public or in a public school. There's something really threatening about all of this. The Lordship of Jesus Christ. I don't want the Lordship of Christ. I want to be my own Lord. Don't tell me about morality or rightness or holiness or God. I don't want any of that. I'm, I'm my own, a captain of my own soul, my own faith, you know, that kind of thing. But here, Herod is very troubled in contrast with the wise men who came all this way to worship this king of Israel. Assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, Herod inquired at, of them where the Christ was to be born. No, it's priests and scribes. All right, so he gets the religious teachers, leaders of the day, you know, the PhDs, the synagogue leaders, all of these guys that transcribe Old Testament Scripture. And he says, all right, come here, come here. I want you to tell me where Christ or the Messiah, the promised king, was going to be born. Would you go find that out for me? I'm very, very interested in where. Okay, so they go off and do their little research, and they told them, they told them in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will be shepherd of my people. This is a quotation from Micah, the prophet, chapter 5, verse 2. These religious leaders, scribes, they go, they study their Old Testament, they go, here it is. Micah 5, 2 says, a ruler will come where? From Bethlehem. This ruler, Christ, is to be born in Bethlehem. All right? Now, Micah is a prophet some 600 years before Christ comes. He prophesies about Christ's coming and the location. Micah, by the way, the copy of his prophecy was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which date 200 B.C. Um, they were written down. So you, this is all, you can get copies of Micah from 200 years before Christ came. You know what I'm saying to you? I'm just saying the Scripture, there's so much more. But Micah says, okay, um, the religious leaders, this is where he's going to be born. Bethlehem who will shepherd my people Israel. A ruler will come from you, shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly. See this little conniving going on. He summons them to ascertain from them what time the star had appeared. So Herod's interesting. You know, it's like, uh, find out where and how old. When did the star appear? How long have you been traveling? Because what is Herod's plan? To find him, and he's going to have the, the kids that are the, a, that age and younger taken out. Because he's so, he's so threatened by Jesus Christ. He has no interest in worship. He has no interest in coming to Jesus. He just wants to find out, get a little information so he can, he can destroy him. He's so threatened. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. Oh, Herod, you're such a great guy. You're wonderful. You want to come worship him? Yeah, yeah. Go find him, you know. Find the exact location. And then let me, let me know. All right, so the Magi, this... I think huge entourage, they leave King Herod, they leave him, and they're heading to Bethlehem, which is only about six miles outside of Jerusalem. It's not very far. You can go there today. It's a beautiful place to go, um, to Bethlehem. And, um, 
After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it arose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. All right, this is why I think, it's, I think it's more of a manifestation of the Shekinah glory of God. Because, you know, the glory of God in the Old Testament would settle on the tabernacle, all right, and then it, would, it, would, it was like a cloud. And as I say, it, even by night, there's a fire of the presence of God and the people of God would see it and follow it, go here and there. They, they see it again, all right? The same one, it says the star that they had seen when it rose, it, it gets up and it rests over the place where the child is. So it's obviously, you can follow it and there it is. I mean, when Jupiter and Saturn, you know, on the 21st of December, we're lined up. It's not like you could follow it and go anywhere. Where are you going to go? You know what I'm saying? It's like, there it is, okay. But it doesn't... You've got to have something else to help us out to find the exact location, especially if it's only six miles away from Jerusalem. So I think probably some manifestation of the glory of God. Again, we don't know for sure, all right? Um, it's fun to think that maybe we saw the Bethlehem star the other night, though, huh? Or, or some kind of conjunction of stars that may have been in the first century. Um, all right, so they go over there to the place where the child was. All right, now notice that they, um, they're going to a, a new place for Mary and Joseph. All right, Mary and Joseph, Jesus was born in a cattle stall, right? A manger. All of that is correct in your nativity set. It was a manger, you know, an, a trough, a little feeding trough, and all of that. There was no room for them in the inn. So there was that. But now they've moved into a different place, and the Greek word that's used here for the child means not a baby. There are two different Greek words, all right? One's for baby, and the other's for a child, a young child. So again, we think, uh, given the length of time that the Wise men would have traveled. Jesus is probably about two years old at this point. And Herod ends up killing children two years and younger because he's threatened by them. So Jesus is a two-year-old. Let's just say that. And they go over to Mary and Joseph's rented place now. This is before they go to Egypt and then go back to Nazareth. And when they saw the star, or could be translated shining... All right? When they saw it, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Real strong language here. It's like, wow, you know, the presence of God leading them to the place where Jesus Christ is. And going into the house, notice house, not manger, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts gold and frankincense and myrrh. All right, you just, can you just picture the scene? Poor Mary and Joseph. I mean, you've got to be overwhelmed if you're Mary and Joseph, right? I mean, like you've had, you've had the angel Gabriel appear to you and tell you that you're going to give birth to the Son of God. You've gone up to your relative at Elizabeth's house while you're pregnant and Elizabeth being pregnant and with John the Baptist, John the Baptist leaps in Elizabeth's womb, and, and then Elizabeth says to Mary, what brings the mother of my Lord here, you know? And, um, and Mary's just overwhelmed by all these things. And the shepherds come when Jesus is born, and they're sharing how the angelic host sang, glory to God in the highest, and when they're out in the field. And, and now, a couple years later, here's this entourage of of these wise men, kings, whatever they are, they're all coming in and they walk in the house and to a two-year-old and they go over and they bow down and worship and pull out all this stuff. I don't know about your two-year-old, but I mean, there's something special about this two-year-old, okay? Uh, most two-year-olds are in time out by this time, you know. <laughs> they're learning about time outs. Jesus Christ, they just... Mary and Joseph is like, what is going on here? That's just another confirmation for them, all right? <clears throat> so, worshipped him. They fell down and worshipped him. Them opening their treasures, they offered him gifts. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. This is why we think, 
Oh, well, some think that there were three of them because, assumedly, every, each king had a gift. All right, so one gold, one frankincense, one myrrh. But it doesn't say that. It just says they opened, they just gave all these gifts. All right. <clears throat> and then, of course, commentators like to think about what is the significance of the gold and what's the significance of the frankincense and what's the significance of the myrrh? Why did they give these gifts? So let's take a shot at that. All right. I mean, they're not here for us to ask them, so we're just going to take a shot at that. Most commentators believe gold. Why? That, the material, the metal that's fit for a king, for royalty. It's the most expensive. It's the most valuable metal back in the first century as well as today. Gold. Gold. Fit for a king. Jesus Christ is king. We brought a gift of gold for a king. What else do you bring to a king but gold, the best? Gold was used in the Old Testament for the tabernacle, the furniture that was inside the tabernacle where the people worshiped God through the priest. It was all the, the, all the Ark of the Covenant made of gold. When Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem, the walls were covered with gold. The furniture was pure gold. The utensils were pure gold. Why? Gold, valuable, wealth, opulence for a king. For a king. And you never come into the presence of a king without bringing a gift. And if you're going to bring a gift, you bring the best gift. That's the whole picture here. Not a copper coin. Not something of brass. Not something of plastic. <laughs> gold. All right, gold. What about the frankincense? Well, frankincense was a, obviously a fragrance. You, they made it by chipping the side of bark of a tree, and then the, the, you know, the ooze of the uh, serum that would come out was used and mixed and created a beautiful fragrance of, that was used in the offering by the priests, they would offer the offering to God, mixing in frankincense for aroma. And you, if you went into the temple, there was frankincense burning all the time for aroma, smell. So um, some commentators, commentators suggest that it's picturing Jesus as priest. Okay? So he's king, he's priest. Priest fits well because he is the one who represents us to God. That's what the priest did in the Old Testament. The high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and offer the blood on the altar, on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. The high priest would for the forgiveness of sins. You didn't go into the place, the holy place, where God was in the temple without the, you know, the high priest representing you. Jesus Christ has gone into the Holy of Holies in heaven and offered his blood for your forgiveness and for mine. And Jesus' blood offered on the altar takes away sin forever, removes it. The blood of goats and bulls and the high priest in the Old Testament, none of that removed it. It was a picture of Jesus. But Jesus, our high priest, frankincense, offered himself for our salvation, for our forgiveness. He's our mediator. Uh, the Latin for priest, pontifex, means a bridge builder. Okay? A priest is a bridge builder. Or as 1 uh, Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says, there is one mediator between God, God and men, the man Christ Jesus. He's the bridge. Christ is the mediator. The mediator by which you and I can enter into the very presence of God through his blood, through his forgiveness, through his grace. No one comes into the presence of the king without a mediator, without an invitation. Christ is not only the king, but the mediation for us to go into the presence of the king. And then myrrh. Myrrh was also a sweet-smelling aroma. And it was used a lot in embalming dead bodies, all right? When Jesus was taken from the cross and Nicodemus asked uh, Pilate for the body, uh, he was given the body, and when Nicodemus went to get Jesus' body, it says in the Gospel of John, he took 75 pounds of myrrh with him to embalm the body of Jesus. And it was to keep the smell of death away. That's the old was the idea of it. So they embalm Jesus' body and so in myrrh. So he's our savior. 
You get the picture here. What what are the gifts about? He's king, he's priest, mediator, and he is savior, the one who saves us from our sins. Jesus Christ, and I, I said it at Christmas, and I'll remind you of it again. You don't understand Christmas unless you understand the cross. You don't understand it. If, if it's just the manger and, you know, good feelings and goodwill towards our neighbor, then it's, that's, not, that's not it. Christmas is the cross that Jesus came into the world for the purpose of dying for us in our place as a substitute, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the one whose blood put on the altar forgives sins and opens the way for access to God. He's, he is the, he's the Savior. The King, the Priest, and the Savior. What a great God we have. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So this is their, this is their worship. What an amazing scene it is. Being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. And that's all we know about these magi. You know, they, they Her- remember Herod wanted them to come back and tell them where Jesus was. And uh, they're warned in a dream, you know, don't go back to Herod. And uh, so they, they go home another way. Joseph is warned by an angel to get out of town. Herod wants to kill him. And by the way, it's like, you know, they get all these all this gold and, and it kind of supports them in Egypt, huh? I mean, I, I was... I, would, I don't know how long they're down there in Egypt. They're there long enough for Herod to eventually die. Now, it probably wasn't too long, a year, two years, whatever, but they have all they need. So Mary and Joseph go to Egypt, which wasn't under the um, uh, Roman Empire at the time. They go to Egypt, and they uh, then, when Herod dies, the angel tells them, okay, you can go home, and then they go back to Nazareth, and in Nazareth, Jesus grows up. Are you with me, everybody? All right, good, all right. Now, <laughs> let's, uh, let's draw some applications. Okay, you ready for this? Let's do some. Here we go. First of all, seek the Lord. That's what the Magi did. I mean, think about the effort of the Magi. They, you know, they're potentially 800 miles away. Okay, if they're in Persia. I mean, 800 miles away. That's a long trip. That's like, that's like you getting on a camel and and all your entourage and going to L.A. and back, all right? It's a long trip. But they did it. They, they knew the Scriptures well enough and have sought the Scriptures to know that a king was born. Something about the Shekinah glory, the shining that drew them. They were really seeking the Lord. I would encourage you. Next week will be a New Year's message, and then we'll get into a new series. But... I would encourage you, 2021, let's seek the Lord. Let's seek the Lord. I mean, what an effort they make. The scribe and Pharisees, they find out from Micah 5, 2, that Jesus is to be born in Bethlehem, but they don't go and find him. They're just sort of, you know, nonchalant. They're really indifferent about it. Herod wants to kill him, but no, no. They, they're those who seek him, seek him. Seek first the kingdom of God, the scripture says, and everything will be added to you. Seek first the kingdom of God. The book of Proverbs says, seek after wisdom like you would jewels and and, uh, fine stones. Seek after wisdom. Colossians says, in Jesus Christ dwells all wisdom and knowledge. All divinity is in Christ. What am I saying to you? Seek Jesus to know him. To have his wisdom, to have knowledge of him. Uh, let's seek him. Let's seek him. And then secondly, um, come and worship. Come and worship. That's what they did. I don't know how long they were there. <laughs> you know, you read the narrative and it's like they came, they worshiped, they offered him gifts, they had a good, maybe at some lunch, and then they're back, heading home. I mean, come and worship. Why do we come to church? You know, whether here or online, why do you come? Why do you come? You come to worship. We want to know the Lord. We want to worship Him. Why? He's worthy. That's what worship means. Worship means worthship, the original word. Worth, a ship, a, a ship that was seaworthy. So worthship, worship comes down to He's worthy. 
He's worthy. We worship Him. You know, um, and I can fall into this, but sometimes we fall into the idea that um, <clears throat> what do I get out of it, you know? What do I get out of it? And uh, let me just tell you, it doesn't matter what you get out of it. <laughs> yeah. Was it was the music good? Was the pastor did he give us something and was there some good coffee? I mean, what did I what do I get out of this thing? We don't care what you get out of it, all right? The main thing is that you come to worship him. That's it. Praise his name, worship him, honor God, all right? And then thirdly, what they did was notice they brought a gift to him. And as I said, you never come into the presence of royalty or a king without presenting a gift. Remember the queen of Sheba came to Solomon to hear his wisdom. She brought with her a whole group entourage. And when she came in to meet King Solomon, she brought gifts of gold and frankincense and other spices from where she was from, Arabia, Sheba in Arabia. She the, the queen of Sheba. So you don't come into the presence of the king without bringing a gift. You say, well, what's my gift? Well, it's your praise of God. It's your worship of God. It's you saying, remember we, we looked at uh, Romans chapter 12 in this last series we did. And Romans 12, 1, in view of God's mercy, offer your body as a living sacrifice to God, which is your reasonable or spiritual worship. Uh, you come in the presence of God saying, here I, here I am, Lord. I'm yours. I want to serve you. That's the way we worship with our, with our voices, with our spiritual gifts, with our bodies. And we bring an offering to him. Not a copper one, but a gold one. <laughs> Fit for a king. You know, whatever, whatever your offering is to God, it should say to God, I worship you. Some people are like, what do I bring for an offering to God? Just... I worship you. I worship you. And I trust you, but I worship you. <clears throat> so these three things, you know, I think we seek the Lord, we come and worship him, and we bring a gift to him. And if in 2021, this is who we are, then 2021 is going to be a good year, you know? It's going to be a good year. And you'll, you'll be a different person at the end of 2021 because of of who you are in your relationship to Jesus Christ. It's always about that. It's always about you and him. And the, the greater your love for him, the greater your offering worship to him, then the, the greater your change. All right? Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. Thank you for the time that we have together to stop and just focus on you. We want to be like these magi, these wise men from the east, and we want to see your glory and follow you and worship you and bow at your feet and offer you our, our gifts given to us by you and offer our bodies a living sacrifice to you. So, Lord, um, receive our gifts. And maybe as we're in prayer right now online and present here, while we're in prayer, continuing it, are you seeking the Lord? I just, I don't know where you're at today. Some of, some of you listening online here present, you know, maybe you've never come to that place where you've found Jesus as your Savior. And you've been seeking other things, only to be disappointed, only to come up empty, maybe in a relationship, maybe in some addiction, maybe in some pleasure, trying to find something. And the Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, who's come to earth, came for the sake of you having peace with Him. And so, if that's you and God's moving in your heart, just receive Jesus today. Say, Jesus, I need you. I want you. I want your salvation, your grace, your mercy. I want you as my King and my priest, my Savior. And Lord, for all of us here today, as we come to the end of 2020, and look forward to what you're going to do in 2021. We trust you. We trust you. You got this. And God, we know you're going to take care of us and all of our needs. And we don't have to worry. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you prayed with me today to have Jesus as your king, your savior, your priest, uh, on the screen is the word believe. 
text the word believe to the number on the screen and we'll get you some information and encourage you because 2021 we want you part of it it's an adventure all right let's look at 2021 as an adventure an adventure in which we trust god who's leading the way all right up for that he we can just trust him he's leading the way all right all right we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna adventure 2021 all right and as we come to the end of the year uh, if you'd like to give a gift for the sake of this gospel going out, uh, there's a ways to give on the screen. And I've encouraged you to pray and ask the Holy Spirit what the Holy Spirit would have you to give. Husband and wife, you're married, pray together, ask God. Single, say, Holy Spirit, give me that, give me a number, something. My wife and I do this every year, and we came to the, we came to the same number. Actually, my number was lower than hers, so we're going with hers, all right? And uh, because the Holy Spirit, I told you, will always move you to give a gift to God that represents faith and honors Him, all right? Honors Him. So do that. Trust Him. He'll take care of the rest. Lord, thank you that we can get to give what already belongs to you. It's all yours. We love you. We worship you. We want our hearts to increase in love for you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said. Amen.